Well, let me just start with this. That uh, uh, Welcome everybody out in internet land and anybody from MIT as well. And let me mention that uh, this Saturday night or Sunday morning, I guess officially Sunday morning, uh, much of the United States is going to be changing the clocks. And so if you're somewhere that isn't changing the clocks, you might want to keep that in mind. If you're looking for us uh, Monday, 1 p.m. Eastern, it might well be um, an hour. I never remember whether it's earlier or later for you um, than it usually is. So I know the rest of, uh, I know most of Europe is going to be doing it two weeks from now. And so I guess it will be an hour earlier for, for those of you in Europe, for example. Okay. Next thing is we seem to have had a little bit of a problem with the website. And so I was going to just try quickly to see what I think would work, but Dave tells me it won't work, but I want to see it for myself. So I'm going to go to Pluto and I've gotten into the habit of putting URLs right here. So um, I, I thought that this would work, but David tells me no. And David is usually right, but I'm going to try it anyway and see if it will work. And it does work. Okay, this time, it, Dave, I guess this time it worked. Again, okay, I'm, I'm glad, to, glad to know that. Right, so, so, so the, uh, the, the actual URL, uh, which, let's see, what is the, can we, could we put it in the Discord or something so that people can find it? I don't know. You already did, even better, okay. So this will be the first notebook for today, the structure.jl. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is talking about a real computational thinking idea, which is taking advantage of structure. And structure can mean many things, and I'll give you a few examples. And then uh, depending on how the time goes, we're also going to talk about a particular kind of structure, which is principal components analysis. And that's this over here. So uh, this is this this particular notebook, which I gather Dave has already put into the uh, Discord, so you can find that as well. So let me start with talking about structure. And there's a new feature that is going to be in the notebooks, and we're going to work backwards and get them in the old notebooks as well, which is what are the Julia, uh, what are the Julia commands uh, structures that are going to appear in this notebook. And so I made a list here. You can see four items, uh, basically struck, dump, you know, daggle and sparse. So I'll count as one item and error. So we're going to make an effort to put this at the beginning of every notebook. So you could figure out what little bits of Julia you'll be learning in this, in this particular lecture at the same time. So thanks, Charles, for that nice idea. Okay. So structure, examples of structure. So let's see. I see if this is too big, the table of contents. Let's see, is this too small for you, Dave? Should I make it bigger? You always like me to zoom in. But I also like the table of contents on the side. Um, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> All righty. Okay, so uh, structure. So the best way to talk about structure is to give some examples. But let me say that even if, if you were around for the last lecture of this semester, we talked about dynamic programming. And you might remember that the structure that we took advantage of was the common subproblems, right? So that uh, there were these paths that would go left, down, and right, or I call them southwest, south, and southeast. And these were not just sort of random paths, but these were paths that had a structure to them. That is actually a common, they had a common substructure. So that's perhaps one example, but let me kind of go a little slower and talk about other problems that have a structure. So here's a really simple structure. Uh, and this is the so-called one-hot vector. It's a name that comes from machine learning. It's a very simple idea. I really like the name one-hot vector. Um, here's, a, here's an example of a one-hot vector, okay? This is a vector that's made up of zeros and ones, but only one of the elements is hot, right? The rest are cold, okay? So what that means is uh, exactly one element is one and the rest are all zero, okay? And so that is a one-hot vector. Uh, in linear algebra, it might be called the column of the identity or, or a coordinate basis vector, but none of those words seem as good to me as one hot vector. I really like that name. So I hope you like it too. Uh, and the first and why, Alan, does it say one hat vector? My one hat vector. Yours says one hat? Yours says one hat. One, Look below. 
The name of the variable says my variable y is one half right. vector. I don't know. But uh, we, we could change it. Well, it's being defined again below. So you be careful. I don't know. Uh, is it being one, my one hot vector is over here. Yeah. May, oh, may, I wonder if that happened because we didn't want to clash. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. That's probably what happens. I don't remember anymore. I wrote it last That's week. a funny way to do it though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it um, I don't remember my own sense of humor, if it was even me. Uh, okay. That's because that's the American pronunciation. <laughs> one hot vector. There you go. So I would like to ask a question, which is for everybody to think about, is how much information do you need to represent this vector? Obviously it's made up of six elements, but do you really need six numbers to represent this vector? So is it, you know, if n is six, do you need n, do you need one, do you need two? I mean, really how much, what is the information content? Okay, and I'm sure you can all realize that two numbers ought to be enough, right? They're, the, the size six and the position of the one, two kind of tells you the whole story, really, right? So it seems sort of like, it seems silly to write out a vector zero, one, zero, 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 zero in the context of one hot vectors because two numbers will do the trick. By the way, just to mention that there's also the word one cold, okay? And a one cold vector is a, again, a vector of zeros and ones, but only one of the elements is cold, that is a zero. Um, but we're going to concentrate on one hot vectors and I'm going to show you how you create a structure in Julia that takes advantage of the structure and you know coincidentally enough that to create something in Julia that takes advantage of structure it's called a struct right this is a new type in Julia that you get to create yourself okay and so um, this part you could ignore right now if you find it a little bit confusing but basically we're going to say that a one hot, I'm going to create a one hot, and it's going to be made up of two things. It's going to be made up of an, of an integer n and an integer k, and that's it. So a one hot is going to be two integers. It's, it's not going to be, there's, there's nothing more to one hot really. It's just these two integers. And just to tell you what this is, in case you're curious, we're saying that this will be a subtype of an abstract vector of ints, and so that it behaves in many ways like a vector of integers, even though it's not a vector of integers, it's a one hot. Okay, but it'll be a, it'll be a subtype. That's this funny punctuation, a subtype um, of an abstract ve vector made out of ints. Okay, and a couple of quick things that are actually useful to have if you're going to create an abstract vector, and it's going to be handy here, is to define the size of. We want to see. We want to pretend this is a vector, even though it's not exactly a vector. So um, what can you do with a vector? Well, you can get its size. So this says that if you ask for the, the size of, of a one hot, you should give me back the n, right? So the n is actually the size. This, this is just the way here, um, maybe I'll go over here and put this in. If I were to do the size of my one hat vector, you see, I just got a six. Right, and so we want this to behave in the same way, even though we're not storing all those zeros and ones. Another thing we want to do is get index, right? So we want to do things like, we want to do the analogy of my one hat, by the way, I just hit tab to make it faster, right? If I type my hat one vector of two, I'll get the one, but if I do any other thing, I'll get a zero, right? If I, if I call it with any other index, I get a zero. So a, a valid index. I'll get a zero. So I want that behavior too. And so the command there is get index. Maybe I should have added size and get index to things that we are showing off in Julia today. And uh, we need a one hot vector and an I. And basically what we're gonna check is whether the, uh, what, what we're checking is whether the number K in, in, in the one hot vector is equal to I, right? And we'll turn it into an int. So this is a true or a false which becomes a zero or a one as it's turned into an int, okay? And so to actually pull this off, I could create a one hot vector by just typing one hot of six two. And you see, it actually gives you the illusion of a vector, right? I mean, it even looks to Julia as if it's a vector, right? But um, 
yeah, let's see. My one hot vector, oh, right. And if I, if I actually index it, for example, if I index it with two, I get the one. But if I index it with four, I get the zero. This completely has the full illusion of being a vector of zeros and ones. And yet it actually takes advantage of the structure. And one way you could actually see that is um, I'm going to mention the, the, the dump and the, with a small d and a capital D. Uh, in, in capital D, it actually prints in Pluto without, um, without any fuss. The small d, you have to do this silly Pluto thing with terminal, but I actually think it looks very nice. It kind of highlights, it's sort of like, to me, it looks like a blackboard. So I think I actually kind of like the with terminal just to highlight it. But in any event, dump, what dump does is it kind of tells you everything that's going inside that object. So if I dump my one hot vector, you'll see that I'm getting two integers, the six and the two, right? So you can use the capital D if you like, and it'll just print it sort of the boring way, or you can use the little d. And uh, if you just do the little d, I'll show you, Pluto kind of ignores it. A regular Julia REPL wouldn't. But if you add this with terminal do thing, then you get this sort of nice blackboardy thing. Okay, so uh, there you have it. The my one hot vector is um, storing the two pieces of information that are critical to defining without wasting any space at all, right? And so that's structure. That's taking advantage of uh, structure. Okay, and I don't know why, but I like to do visuals. So here's visualizing a one hot vector. Um, n is the n is the size. So here I'm just making n be 13. Here you could actually see it, and then k specifies where the one is. And so here's just a little visual. I don't know if this adds much to the story, but it's, it's fun to look at. So um, here are some one half vectors. OK, but let me move on now. So just a comment that basically what we're saying is that there's one hot object behaves as if it were a vector. It has the same behavior. You could not actually tell when you're indexing into it or when you're doing length of it. You can't actually tell how it's being stored internally. It has exactly the same behavior to the user. Right. And we already saw another example of that, which was range objects also behave like that. You can index into ranges and you can take the length of ranges. You don't know if how many pieces of information they're storing. Oh, let's do a dump. Let's go dump of one colon seven. Though I, we may have done this before, but let's just do it again. Need capital D. Yes, we do. Or I have to do the with terminal. So um, there you see the. This also has two numbers, a start and a stop, right? If on the other hand, we took a range that was, you know, like even numbers from two to 17 or something, then there's three numbers that store this, the two, the two, and it's clever enough to know that if you're starting at an even, you're actually literally stopping at a 16. So uh, that's actually what's stored inside the computer is basically just these three integers for a range. By the way, something that came up the other day, and you'll see it in your MIT X homework, also inspired by Charles, is if you um, if, if you actually dump this thing, you'll see that it is a vector that actually contains the range, right? And so uh, there's a difference, and we'll explore that in the MIT X homework. There's a difference between this, which is just a range, and this, which is here. Let's make a, a vector that has a couple of ranges in it. So this is a vector of size two, and you can see that each element is itself a range, okay? All right, so that's enough of that stuff. Let's do another example of structure that, let's take a diagonal matrix, okay? So here is a diagonal um, matrix that, I don't know if people see matrices in high school anymore, um, as you might see in, let's just say, I think it's better to say an elementary linear algebra class. I think that would be a better way to say it. So here's a diagonal matrix. Uh, it's a diagonal matrix is one that uh, only has non-zeros potentially off on the diagonal, right? All the off diagonal elements are zero. So this is uh, a diagonal matrix but for a three by three array, I think you could see that I only needed three numbers to represent it, right? For an n by n matrix, I would only need n numbers to represent a diagonal matrix. And so I don't know if your linear algebra class, they make you write out all the zeros or put in the dots, but it is silly to store them on a computer, especially if the matrix is large. I guess if it's small, it doesn't really matter. 
but uh, uh, Julia has a, a, a type called a diagonal, and it even prints them out kind of pretty. You can see there's dots where the zeros would be, okay? Um, and we, let, let's do the dump right now of the, I can't remember if I did it later, but let's do it right here. You could see that um, the numbers that are stored are the five, the six, and the minus 10, right? There's no, there's no zeros stored. That, that's to be contrast, if you will, with the, if I dump the density, the one that I first defined, and uh, as you probably would expect, this one is storing all of these numbers, the zeros are, are stored. So again, structure, the structure of this diagonal matrix is just to have these numbers, five, six, and minus 10, okay? And so, uh, as I was just showing before, you could, you could, you could take a, a, a full matrix or sometimes it's called a dense matrix, sort of a, a matrix in regular format. And you can um, cast it to being a diagonal using diagonal, or you could actually create it by just simply saying, what are the diagonal entries? Okay, I put it over here as well. Um, uh, so, you know, I guess this is sort of always a good idea. It's kind of an obvious idea, but what, for any kind of data structure at all, any kind of algorithm, we're always trying to look for structure where it exists. So let me now introduce the idea of sparse matrices, um, which is kind of what we've been doing already, but there's sort of a more general concept. A lot of people would not call a diagonal matrix a sparse matrix, though technically it fits in. Um, but you know, maybe a lot of people wouldn't call a square a rectangle, though technically a square is a rectangle. I mean, if something's a square, you should call it a square because that gives more information. So what's a sparse matrix? Um, so, so a sparse matrix is, um, is a different, yeah, a sparse matrix, a sparse matrix is, let's, let's give the official definition, is a matrix that has many zeros worth storing in a sparse structure. And I'm gonna tell you what that means in a minute. Okay, that's that's sort of what a sparse matrix is. Uh, what did I do? Do I have too many quotes here? Here, let's put it. Can I do this? Okay. All right. So it's part. And so here is a very simple example. Uh, here is a matrix that obviously has three non-zeros. Okay, the twelve, the nine, and the four. Okay, and um, here is a sparse representation of the same matrix. And for the human eye, this is actually not how it's stored, but for the human eye, you could say, well, the IJ, you know, the row and column index for the nine is three, one, and the, uh, sorry, the, the third row and first column is the 12, the first row and third column is the nine, and the bottom right, the three, three entry is a four, right? And so, uh, and the, all the other entries are presumed to be zero, okay? And if you use the sparse arrays Julia package, you can go and see what's inside one of these matrices. And uh, it's a little bit tricky and I wasn't really planning to go into this, but it's not that bad. So I think I will show it to you to show, to, to see how a general dense, sorry, a general sparse matrix is stored. And, and maybe this is why I don't think of diagonal matrices as sparse matrices because they have a special storage, right? So, so they, they're, they're somehow, that's why I don't like to think of them as a general sparse matrix. But if we dump the, if we jump the, dump the sparse matrix, uh, what we see is besides the sizes, you know, the M by N, the rows and columns being three by three, there are three other vectors stored on the inside, a, a column pointer, a row value, and the non-zero values. And it's kind of better to go from bottom to top, which I've done over here. So the non-zero values are easy to understand. They're just the 12, the nine, and the four. Okay, those are the non-zero values. That's the easiest. This is how it's stored internally. It's called CSC or compressed sparse column format. There are other formats. Uh, this one has become the most common uh, for certain applications because it kind of generally is good for matrix vector products and, and column slicing and so forth. But uh, yeah, so it's made up of 1294, the non-zero elements, and the row values are just the indices, the I indices, 313. It's the same 313 that you'll see over here. It's the first column. Right, so the 12 is in the third row, the nine is in the first row, and the four is in the third row. But instead of storing J, we're storing something a little bit different. 
we're storing the, the column pointer thing is is always of length one more than the number than the nz vowel. So if this is three, this is of length four. And what it's doing is it's a pointer into nz vowel, which tells you where the uh, first non-zero is in that column. And that might even be in the next column. So for example, because you know, let, maybe I should, should I, let me put in put an eight here and then I'll change it back so you can actually follow this along. Um, yeah, so oh, I want to be able to see this at the same time. Can I do that? I'm going to make it one smaller. Hope you'll be able to still see it. Okay, so what this says is you'll notice that uh, the, the oh, let's put a few more entries in, maybe here. Okay, so uh, the one points to the first entry of this vector and it says 12. And the 12 is the first non-zero in this column. Two points to the second entry and eight is the first non-zero in this column, okay? Four says, we're gonna look at this, the nine, and the nine is the first entry in the third column. And six actually doesn't point anywhere at all, right? It kind of falls off the end. And it tells you, it's, it's the way of indicating there's no further columns. Okay, uh, that's kind of the way it, 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 it's done. Uh, so I guess you could have just stopped with N, but this is the way it's done. It's, 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 it's pointing to the one column afterwards. Okay, now the fun happens if, if I zero out the second column, which is how we started out. If I zero out the second column, then something interesting happens. It says, oh, the, the, the first non-zero is a nine for the second column. It's the second entry, and by the way, for the third column as well. Okay, I wasn't gonna go too far into this. It's a little bit tricky, uh, but this is how sparse matrices are stored. Uh, so the, the main point here is we store the values, we store the I, and we do something a little bit tricky that's somehow equivalent to getting the J, okay? But I'd like to show you an example where this may not be a particularly good storage scheme. Here, I'm gonna create a sparse matrix that is a million by a million, it actually, is, is if you thought of it as a matrix, it has a million rows and a million columns. And the way I did that was I just created an entry where the, the, the million by million, the, the I equals a million, J equals a million entry is the number nine. So that automatically creates a million by million matrix. And even though we only have three non zeros and they're in three rows, uh, this thing here actually has to create an entry for each and every column so it's actually one more than the, I mean, it's, it's not one more than NZ val because it has an entry for each column. Uh, it's actually one more than the number of columns. So there's actually a million and one entry stored here, which seems crazy, but that's exactly what it is. Okay, uh, enough with sparse matrices. Let's go on to a different kind of structure. So up until now in this notebook, I was kind of thinking about the storage structures where you can somehow save you don't have to store everything because like the zeros were implicit, okay? Now I would like to talk about a different kind of structure that, that's not a storage structure. It's the kind of structure that comes from randomness. And we're right now in the, for this course, we're in the transition from module one to module two, where in module two, we're gonna be talking about uh, statistics and probability. And so this is kind of a perfect segue between the two modules. So um, let's talk about how much structure there is in a random vector, right? So here I'm going to create, uh, this is Julia's command to create, and again, maybe I should add this, but I think we've seen it before. I'm going to create a, a vector with 1 million entries and all the digits are from one to nine. Okay, so here's a bit of that vector V, there's a more, if here's a kind of one way of displaying it if you, if you want to see it, but a million entries, there's you know the top 20 and the bottom 10. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there's a million numbers. And the first thing you might say when I ask how much structure is there in a random vector, you might say, there's no structure. It's a random vector, right? I mean, it's random, it has no structure. I actually like to say that randomness is itself a structure. I, I, I don't tend to think of random objects as, as nothing special objects or objects with no structure. They have a lot of structure and, um, so much of, of science and algorithms is, is, is based on taking advantage of the structure of randomness. It's, it's, 
the, the word random in common English almost suggests that, that it's the opposite of structure, but it's just not true. So uh, for example, we could take the mean and the standard deviation, and some would say that there's a structure right there. For example, I took the mean of this vector and um, I, I wanna compare it with the number five and you know the four digits, it's, it's just about the number five. You could take the standard deviation and I happen to know that it's the square root of 20 thirds and I could calculate it. You could see to a couple of digits, it's right there. So this random object, I could get a new one. Here, let's get another one. I could do it many times. There's something structured about this thing, right? To three or four digits, the main and the standard deviation are not changing, right? So there's some structure right there. Um, I mean, sometimes statisticians and, and maybe professors who've just graded exams would say that the mean and the variance is the structure and the rest is not even relevant. So sometimes people will sort of write down or note the mean and the standard deviation and, and, and in some instances just throw out the rest because that's perhaps all you really wanna know. So uh, in well, terms you, of, you also might want to know how many fives there are in the, in the list. Well, then I would have to not throw out my data. Right, but you could reduce the data by just counting the number of ones, the number of twos, the number of threes, et cetera. Yeah, um, you don't want me to do this, do you? There's how many fives were in this data set. So, yep. uh, um, but I could also, how do I do this? Can, can I go, I'd have to have statistics to go hist of the, um, you need, you probably want plots. You probably don't want to. How about I, just, how about I do this? Um, this will be more fun anyway. For i equals zero through nine, as long as you're, this will goes, from, goes from one to nine. I'm going from one to, oh, that's fine. It'll count the zeros too. Uh, oh, that's why I said, that's why I got like one ninth of a million. Aha. Uh -huh. I was wondering why I didn't get a, like 10,000 or 100,000. Okay. Um, sum of V is equal to I. Okay, so here, here are the actual numbers. Yep. So, you know, so, so I remember um, when I was a kid, they used to publish like the, the Powerball numbers in the newspaper, whatever the lottery was. And like people would, 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 you know, oh, this one seems to have more. So we should, we should go for that or something. Um, or is this one, the one? Wait, this one is, this one maybe the biggest one. Yeah, uh, no, I can't spot it quickly. I'm sorry. This one seems to be the biggest one. Yeah, so maybe the number four comes up a little more often. So maybe you should choose the number four. Of course, that's ridiculous. But, uh, uh, but yes, that the, this might be something you might store away, for example, and then throw away the rest of the data, okay? Um, so for those of you who don't know what the mean is, but I bet you everybody does, that's just the, that's just the sum of V over the length of V. And uh, the standard deviation is maybe a little bit less familiar, um, what you do is you take your vector and then you demean it, right? And um, you subtract the mean from the vector and then you take the sum of the squares, which kind of gives you sort of a, a distance from the mean squared thing. And then there's always that mysterious, and then you don't take the average by length, but you just subtract one and people owe that to the degrees of freedom. I, I always hated that explanation, but that is what people do. And that is the variance. And then to get the, the uh, standard deviation, you take the square root. And by the way, that's what Willie does. When you take FCD of V, you get the exact same number. It's, it's exactly this formula to get, uh, to, to get the standard deviation. Okay. Um, so yeah, sometimes the summary statistics are all you want, but sometimes not. All right, let me go to another kind of structure, multiplication tables. Okay. So I'm going to define um, an outer product function of two vectors. And all I'm doing is I'm taking all the possible ways of multiplying an element of V with an element of W. Okay, for example, um, if I'm taking outer of one through 10, one through 10, I would get um, what would be an ordinary multiplication table. And um, I think I kind of added it to a slider, which is more fun. So here's the 10 by 10 multiplication table. Uh, last time when I did this last semester, David told me that in England, everybody learns the 12 by 12 multiplication table, right? So, uh, but nonetheless, here's the multiplication table. Uh, you can let us know what you, I, I, in my school, it was 10 by 10. I didn't go to as good a school as, as David went to. But, you know, you rapidly forget it soon after you learn it. Oh, I know the <laughs> by 12 by 12 multiplication table. It just wasn't taught in my school. 
I, I, I've never forgotten this. Uh, I, you know, I forget what happened yesterday, but my 12 by 12 multiplication table, I got done fast. That's no problem. So, so, but just to look at a few more outer products, instead of going through one through 10, for example, um, you could take two, four, six, and 10, 100,000, and you could see all the possible ways of multiplying a number here with a, with a number here. Okay, and uh, so this is, a multiplication table is a kind of structure, but it's not sparse. I mean, there are no zeros. Uh, it's not a diagonal matrix, but it's clear that you don't need n squared numbers to represent this object, right? It's got structure, but it's not a sparse structure. The interesting thing is that in many, many applications of matrices, there is structure, but it's not sparse structure that turns out to be truly important. It's sometimes a slightly more hidden structure, uh, but here you can see that the structure is that of a multiplication table, right? Sometimes it's not obvious that it is a multiplication table. For example, uh, here is a bunch of numbers made up randomly. And I don't know, maybe you're better than me, but I look at this three by four matrix and I'm not sure I would recognize that it is a multiplication table, that it, that it comes from every product of one vector and another. I mean, maybe you could look at the magnitudes and start to guess, but it's not so easy, just not by the human eye. Um, here's a sort of picture of a 10 by 10 version. And maybe it's a little bit more obvious with the picture because multiplication tables sometimes tend to have this sort of striped structure. So you might guess that it's a uh, multiplication table. But um, what we're going to do is actually factor out the multiplication table if it's there. And so here's a little code that will factor it out and more or less doing the obvious, which is the, a multiplication table can be obtained by taking the first row and the first column and then kind of dealing with the one, one element. And so, uh, so here I'm extracting the first row, here I'm extracting the first column and I'm dividing the first row by the first element um, as long as I can. And then I'm just, and now I wanna see, is it really a multiplication table? And so if the outer VW is about the same thing, I'll say it did. Otherwise I'm going to uh, call an error. And so here's where exceptions are thrown in Julia. This is a way to kind of, talk about exceptions. Uh, if this doesn't work out, we'll say the input is, is not a multiplication table. Okay, and so um, you can see I can factor, for example, one, two, three times two, two, two. But when I do that, I may not get my inputs back, right? And I, an equally valid V and W would be two, four, six and one, 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 right? Because uh, every time I, right, I've just, I've doubled this one and I have this one, which amounts to the same thing, right? There's this entire, there's always sort of like an infinite number of things that could have worked out and it doesn't really matter which one. But look, if I try to factor a random two by two matrix, the error is working like I want. Now, I know when you see this black and these lines one through three, you think, oh my God, I have a bug. But no, I actually caused this to happen. This was deliberate, right? I am calling it with a random matrix and it is not a multiplication table, right? Most matrices are not, uh, are not multiplication tables. Okay. Um, however, um, yeah. So the question is, can we find the structure? Can we find multiplication tables? Is there a way to do it? And the truth is we could do even better than that. If we have something that's, for example, the sum of two multiplication tables, there is a technique for finding both of them actually to find, a, to find two outer products. And um, the magic thing that does that is the very famous similar value decomposition which you may see in another course, or you, know, you, may, you may see it in an upcoming course, you might've seen it uh, before, but it is probably the single most used linear algebra thing. Um, it's one of the most important, certainly being used in statistics these days. Uh, there are some people who would say that starting linear algebra classes with Gauss elimination is, is, is no longer the right thing to do because the SVD is the big thing these days. Um, so the singular value because it actually finds the structure. So before I even tell you what it is, let's just do it and just see what happens. So here I'm going to take this matrix, okay? And I'm going to, you know, when there are a lot of times I actually run a function before I even know what the name means. I'm doing that with you. I mean, maybe that's a kind of computational thinking, which is just play with something, right? So I'm going to play with the SVD. And I guess you could see how it's called. You could see that it has three output arguments. 
My zoom thing is in front of me, so I can't quite see this, but um, you could see an example somewhere here, like uh, here, here, you know, US comma V is, is, there's usually three outputs to the SVD, so you could see that over there. Uh, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use a common notation, which is U, sigma, and V, okay? And uh, I'm going to check that I found two outer products. So here, look, outer of this plus outer of this, and this should recover my original matrix, uh, which is A, you see? So this, this magic thing is actually extracting the multiplication tables that are sitting inside of a matrix, okay? Um, and the cool thing is, is it could be done approximately as well, um, I'm gonna skip this just for a moment because I think Dave's planning to talk about flags, but let me show you what happens. You know you know, I mean by now, I like to take SVDs. I, I like whatever you can do with matrices, I like to do it with images. So I think it would be fun to do this with an image. So here's an image of a tree. And what I'm gonna do first of all is separate out the red, green, and blue components, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is separately add the multiplication tables. And so when I go to the end, I've got, Sort of the full tree. When I do one, I've got the I've got the one multiplication table. In, in linear algebra language, it's called the rank one matrix, right? So the red and the green and the blue are separately multiplication tables, and it comes out plaid like you saw before. You could have the rank two tree, and this looks sort of Minecraft-like, right? I mean, everything's sort of rectangular, I guess, right? So if you've ever played Minecraft, I think this is what my kids play it all the time. I see it on their screens. This is what it looks like. Okay, um, when you get to the sum of three multiplication tables, it's officially called rank three. It, it, you start to get a couple of more boxes. And then, you know, as you start adding uh, rank, you can see that, uh, you know, we, we, we start to get a better and better version with the tree with some artifacts, right? Which start to disappear as you add more and more rank. Okay, so this is sort of a meant to be the quick introduction to the SVD. There's so much more that can be said about it. Uh, but right now, for Right now, for the purposes of this lecture, I want you to understand that the singular value decomposition is a way of breaking up a matrix into a sum of multiplication tables. And by a multiplication table, I just mean outer products, right? And um, the SVD does it in such a way that if you, you, if you only have rank one, you've got the best possible rank way of doing it. If you, if you have rank four, it's the sum of the best possible by some sense of multiplication tables. So I'd like to leave it that at leave it at that for now. Like I said, there's so much more. But uh, I think you could just you you can just talk about flags a bit. You want me to talk about flags? All right, I will do the flags then. All right, let's go back up to the flags and talk about flags. So where where we left the story is um, here. So let's see where where was I? Um, well, or I can whatever. It's... Yeah, I think. I think you're, yeah, why don't you go ahead, Dave? I'm going to turn this over to you. And for those of you who joined late, let me again remind you that if you're watching us on Monday, uh, you might want to keep track, depending on where you are, that we are going to be pushing the clock one hour forward in most of the United States on Sunday morning. But Europe is doing it two weeks later, and other places may not do it at all. Most of Europe, not all of Europe. OK, Dave, you want to take over? Take over the screen? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, actually, hold on. Sorry. Okay. Can you see my screen? We do. Hi, everybody. So uh, yeah, we're carrying on the same kind of topic. As Alan said, we're uh, transitioning into the second module of the course on uh, data and probability and statistics. And so um, let's look at this very nice uh, subject called principal component analysis, which is the name from statistics, which is basically the same as the SVD that Alan was just talking about in linear algebra. So what we want to do is understand data. If we're given some data, 
Um, you know, we've been thinking of images as our input data, but of course there's lots of other kinds of data in the world that, that are often in just sort of big matrices full of numbers. And we, we want to somehow extract information from those matrices. And that's the goal of this method of principal component analysis that we'll talk about in detail next time. Uh, but let's start off by uh, thinking again about these multiplication tables that we've just been looking at or outer products. So here's this table of, um, again, of just at the, uh, the same outer product that Alan was just talking about. So here's a multiplication table. It doesn't not have to be square. You could multiply the numbers from one to 10 by the numbers from one to 12. And then uh, we get this dense matrix, <clears throat> but it has a lot of structure in the sense that the whole matrix can be reproduced from just these two vectors. So instead of 120 numbers, I just need you know, 10 numbers plus 12 numbers and the information, the extra information that to, you know, that this matrix is created by doing this particular operation. So if I have those pieces of information, then I can reconstruct the whole matrix and I don't have to store the actual matrix. And so you could just store those, those two vectors and do something very analogous to what Alan did with one hot vector and make a new type where you defined get index to, you know, to extract the, the six, nine component by, it would actually in the moment multiply those numbers together and return that value. So exercise for the reader, implement that um, you know, uh, outer product or what or multiplication table type that does exactly that. So the point is that each column, you know, if we think about what is the structure of this, what does this matrix look like? What is a, what is a an outer product or a multiplication table? Uh, it means that each column is just a multiple of any of the other columns. <clears throat> so in this case, you know, this eight column is a multiple of this six column, which multiple is it? It's eight divided by six times this column. So that's, uh, you know, 1.26 1. 1. or something times this column. And each column is um, actually a multiple of any other column and each row is a multiple of any other row. And so it has this sort of very uh, nice structure, but as Alan said, you know, it's not obvious just by staring at the table that that's the case. And so we want a way to actually realize that that's the case. And flags, uh, flags as in flags of countries, uh, provide a pretty visual um, example of this. So here's a flag that you know um, corresponds not with those colors, but the, that kind of shape corresponds to various different countries. Flags, um, I'm not very good with flags, so I don't actually remember which countries go which way round. Uh, but you know, you could you could either have these horizontal stripes or vertical stripes. And if you think of those as numbers, like this this matrix, this table of data here you see that, oh yeah, that is a rank one matrix. That's what we're going to call matrices, which are um, just outer products, which are given by exactly an outer product, right? So what is this outer product? It's, it's just given by the vector 1, 0.1 and 2.0 on the vertic in the vertical direction. And then in the horizontal direction, in this particular case, I'm just multiplying, uh, you know, each column is exactly the same. And so I get exactly just repeating the same pattern in, in each column and so I get these three colored stripes that are exactly the same all the way along. But a more general rank one matrix or outer product would have different values, right? So I'm, I'm actually multiply, I can multiply, as I said, um, each column by different amounts. And then if I draw that, I get a different kind of flag that I don't think corresponds to any country, which is this, this, uh, this particular, this, this kind of thing. So a more general outer product looks like this and you have to get this blocky structure that Alan was talking about. So let's just generate some bigger matrices with this outer product or rank one shape or structure and look at what they look like. So they look something like this. So you see that we get this kind of um, nice, you know, you could probably sell this in a modern art gallery. Um, it's, it's uh, but, but it has this, this, this very uh, particular structure with these columns of color and then there's rows of color and this sort of checkerboard shape and that's what a rank one matrix looks like so you know if you if someone gives you a picture like that you could sort of try and guess oh yes that is a rank one matrix in other words i could write it just using one single column and one single row and multiplying them in this way but now what about a ran what what is uh what, what if we start doing this reconstruction that alan just mentioned and we start and we, we now look at a rank two matrix. So that means we take one of these checkerboards, one of these outer products, 
and we add another one to it. And that looks like this. So you can see that, well, we're starting to lose some of the checkerboard structure, but it's still sort of there, right? So um, if you sort of see checkerboard structure, you might imagine that it's just a sum of two outer products or maybe three. Uh, and you know, if I run this cell again, we can see a, a different version of that picture. And each time we run it, we'll just get different pictures. The colors correspond to the, the values, you know, um, I guess yellow and red are high values so close to one and blue is close to zero. And um, yeah, and that also depends uh, on how, of course, on how much randomness you have. And so it starts to look less regular, but it still sort of looks, look, has basically the same structure. And so you could visually guess, oh, you know, maybe, maybe I can represent this matrix with less information than the whole matrix. And so, you know, if you needed to transmit this data to somebody, you want to send an image over the internet, can I actually reduce, so part, part, part of the question is, can I reduce the amount of information I need to send to somebody, right? And then I can, um, uh, I can have better video because more people can send, you know, video over the internet at the same time because I'm actually being able to compress the amount of data I need to send. That's sort of in the background of all of these questions. Okay, and so uh, now what about, so there I, I took two rank one matrices and I added them together. So again, rank one, the rank is how many multiplication tables or outer products do I need to add to exactly reconstruct the matrix? That's called the rank. So now let's do something slightly different. So now let's take a rank one matrix, here it is, the same one, and we're going to add random noise to each element separately. So that's what this is doing. This rand n function means a random number with a Gaussian distribution or normal distribution. So it's centered at zero, it has um, standard deviation one and it has a, a Gaussian shape. And we're sampling noise from that distribution. So we're choosing noise in such a way that the probability that we choose the value um, is given by this Gaussian distribution. And we're adding that separately to each pixel in this image. And what do we get? We get something that looks like this. So By the way, it was commented, the it's commented on the YouTube channel, and, and I have to agree that these pictures kind of seem reminiscent of, um, you know, pictures of CPU, you know, the chips pictures that you see. Or FPU That's true. Pictures. Yeah. Yeah. But because somehow um, CPUs are, are made in, this, in a, square, a square grid, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I add more noise, if I add a higher intensity of noise, then the image starts to degrade and you get, it, it looks literally more noisy. And, um, but, but it still kind of has this structure. So again, you would, you would sort of like to say, well, this new matrix is close to this, uh, this structured matrix, even though this one actually, if you try to use the SVD to exactly reconstruct this image, you will need um, to, to, have, to sum a very large number of outer products, uh, which is equal to the dimension of the, the size of the matrix. In other words, the, the smallest one of these. What would you call that, Alan? The uh, minimum of the width and the height of the matrix. I guess so. Yeah. So, but, but you know, it still looks like the original one. And you would really like to say, oh, well, it's, it's basically just this, this one. And so the question is, how can we actually do that? Um, how can we decide that this matrix is just a noisy version of this? In other words, it's close to this one. So we need some no notion of how far two matrices are one from the other. And then we need to, set, to be able to say, oh yes, it, you know, the, 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 the rest is just noise. And so that's the goal of PCA, uh, which is principal component analysis. And so what we're gonna do is think of these images. So, so far we've been you know, thinking of images as visual objects that we, that we like to look at. But now we're going to think of an image is just a matrix and the matrix represents data. And really what we're thinking of is, oh, actually I'm getting some data in a table from somewhere, which we'll call a data matrix. Okay, so, uh, so, we can so let's just take two rows of the image and uh, think of that as some data. So this is my original image, which I created as a rank one matrix. So as an outer product by, you know, again, taking a multiplication table of this vector and this vector. That's how I created this image. And then, um, then we'll also take the noisy version of that that I just made. And I'm gonna put the noise back down 
the, the, the magnitude of the noise back down. So it's just a bit noisy. Okay, and what we're gonna do is extract the first row of this image as a vector of data and the second row as another vector. So here, you know, uh, this is one of the rows. It's just literally a vector of floating point numbers between zero and one. And we're gonna think of that as the data that's coming in that represents, you know, some house prices in Boston. That's a famous data set or, um, you know, some medical data on uh, patients' uh, lifespans, et cetera. Any kind of house for 52 cents? Yeah, so there's some normalization going on. So you actually have to multiply these, these numbers by one, two or three million dollars, and then you'll get uh, the correct house price. So, <clears throat> so what are we gonna do? We're actually going to view these, this, this data in a different, completely different way. We're going to you know, move to more, more, more a kind of scientific point of view, maybe. We're actually gonna plot the data. So, so what is the representation here? So on the x-axis, I'm plotting, you know, I'm plotting points at positions x comma y, on, where I, I literally take the x value as being the first, you know, coordinate in this in this image in this data matrix. So these are the x values in the first row, and the y corresponding y values in the second row. So the columns, I don't know how to highlight a column. Uh, there is some way uh, I looked up the other day, but uh, anyway, the first column is a pair that I'll represent, you know, as that x comma y coordinate on my on my plot. And what I get is this. So what are we looking at? The original rank one image is exactly it, it, uh, are these red squares and they lie exactly along a straight line. So what does that mean? It means that in the original image, each y coordinate is some number times the corresponding x coordinate. And that number is the same for all of the points. Why is that? Because because it's a, 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 a an algebra product, and so uh, you know there is this exact relation that each column is a multiple of the other column, and so when I divide the y and x in each row, uh, in each uh, sorry, in each column, in a given in a given column, when I divide the y value by the x value in that column, I always get the same result, and so they lie on a straight line. Y equals that number times x. And then the noisy image, I'm adding noise to, to basically the X and Y coordinates. And that spreads out slightly into this blue set of data, right? So basically what I'm trying to say is that the data that's coming in from my data source, it probably looks like this blue data. And if I were just to see that blue data, I would see, oh, that seems to be clustering around a straight line. And so actually what I would like to do is extract what straight line it seems to be clustering around and quantify what is the width or the um, sort of uh, spread around that straight line and say, oh, that is actually small. That width is small compared to the length of the data in the other direction. And therefore I would like to conclude that, oh yes, maybe this data is basically just a straight line plus noise. And so that's uh, the idea of you know, the idea behind principal component analysis, and we'll see a computational thinking way to approach that, uh, that algorithm uh, in the next lecture. Great, thanks, Dave. So I think again, we'll say goodbye to the folks on the internet, and then we'll keep the Zoom open a little longer to see if anybody wants to chat. So see everybody on uh, Monday, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Dave? Mm -hmm.